Good afternoon and good evening to those of you in Europe and good morning to those of you already awake in Australia. Welcome to session six of the ESIG 2021 Fall Technical Workshop. I'm Charlie Smith, the Executive Director of ESIG, and I'll provide a few brief opening remarks. As I think you know, we are a global membership based nonprofit organization providing objective technical information, resources, and networking opportunities in support of grid transformation and energy systems integration decisions. We do this through workshops, tutorials, webinars, blogs, working groups, and task forces for our members and by producing technical resource materials and briefing materials for decision makers. Our workshop sessions are all being held online and are open to everyone. This workshop was planned with the input of our ESIG offerings committee, chaired by Bethany Fru of NREL and Julia Matoibasan of ERCOT. The committee consists of the chairs of our six working groups and several of our board members. We have a great set of volunteers who really make ESIG what it is, and we encourage you to become involved if you're not already. You can find us on the web at esig.energy, send an email to info at esig.energy to get our monthly newsletter, and follow our activities on LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. ESIG also serves a leadership role in the Global Power System Transformation Consortium, often called GPST, whose mission is to bring together key actors from around the world to catalyze a rapid clean energy transition at unprecedented scope and scale. ESIG leads pillar one of the GPST, which deals with the research agenda for the system operators. More information on GPST can be found at globalpst.org. In the workshop sessions this month, you'll see the range of issues that need our attention today. If you participate in our working groups and task forces, you'll be working with world-class domain experts on issues that need our attention tomorrow and will be on the agendas of our future workshops. As I mentioned a minute ago, ESIG is a membership-based organization and that's why your membership and your participation in ESIG are so important. If you are the member point of contact for your organization, please keep an eye out for the annual dues invoice coming soon. I thank you if your organization is currently a member and strongly encourage you to consider joining if you are not. Regarding logistics for today, I would ask you to note that the session will be an hour and 45 minutes to allow a little more time for both presentation and discussion. We will have four presentations of approximately 20 minutes each, followed by 20 or 25 minutes for discussion and Q&A. As we are doing with all of our webinars now, we'll be using the Slido platform for managing the Q&A. You should go to slido.com on your device and enter eSIG26 as the event code to ask your questions. Please be sure to indicate the person to whom you're addressing the question. The instructions are also at the bottom of the background slide for the webinar, and you'll be reminded by the session chair. You'll see a thumbs up button next to the question on Slido to allow you to vote on prioritizing the questions submitted. So please keep the questions coming during the presentations and we will address them at the end. We will follow up with written answers to any questions we don't get to during the Q&A. Recognizing the limitations of a webinar with more than 100 people on the line, the lines will be muted. So again, we ask you to use the Slido platform to ask your questions with eSIG26 as the event code. We would also ask you if you're comfortable to identify yourself when you ask a question so we know who we're talking with. Today's session is titled Electric Transportation and Distribution Infrastructure. There's some very innovative work going on in the world of planning, operations, and infrastructure for electric transportation. And today, we'll hear about some of the latest developments in thinking from North America and Europe. The developments in this area are coming fast and furious, and I think we can expect a lot more to come. The increased attention being paid to all aspects of electric transportation is just another indication of the impact that the transformation of our energy system is having on all aspects of the energy business. Mike Hogan is a senior advisor at the Regulatory Assistance Project for Europe and the US and will be chairing our session today. Mike works in the area of power industry decarbonization, focusing on wholesale market design and system integration of variable energy supply. 
He brings a valuable perspective and a lot of insight and experience to everything that he does. He's a good friend of ESIG and has been a familiar face at ESIG workshops for the last couple of years. I'm very happy to have him here today chairing the session. Mike, we appreciate your participation and I'll now turn it over to you. Thanks a lot, Charlie, and thanks for the introduction. Um, we've got a great panel for you. Four expert presenters on the challenges and opportunities for integrating electrified transport into distribution systems. We'll begin with two panelists who will characterize some of the top challenges facing distribution systems in this transition, followed by two panelists who've analyzed potential solutions to those challenges. Our first panelist is Jay Oliver, Managing Director for Grid Systems Integration uh, at Duke Energy in Charlotte, North Carolina. As such, he leads Duke's battery storage development, transport electrification, grid connectivity strategy, demand side management, and clean energy programs. Jay's a rambling wreck from Georgia Tech where he earned a degree in electrical engineering and also an MBA from the University of South Florida. And he has 25 years of experience in distribution, transmission, and related technology development. Please remember to post your questions to slido.com, event code ESIG26. And Jay, over to you. All right. Uh, can I just get a confirmation? Everybody can see and hear me. Thank you, Jay. Okay, yep. excellent. Uh, give me one minute. I'm going to share my screen here. All right. Sorry, but one more confirmation. Folks can see that screen. Yep. Okay, good uh, afternoon, everybody and really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you all today um, about vehicle electrification and uh, or transportation electrification, probably a better way uh, to put it. Um, and I'm going to start by learning how to operate my keyboard. So this is what's ahead of us. Now, this was before COVID hit, and, uh, you know, this would be in the United States, and my uh, talk today is going to focus on the United States because that's where my experience is. But you can see what's ahead of us. About $1 billion a day spent on electricity, about $1 billion a day spent on gasoline. This transition is going to be massive in the electric utility industry. But you can't really look at this problem without taking a look at the bigger picture of what is happening today in our industry. And again, I'm gonna focus a little bit more on the United States because I'm, I'm much more familiar. So here's what's happening right now. Um, you know, we are in the midst of a uh, clean energy transition here in the United States. And I know at Duke Energy, we are uh, trying to accelerate our clean energy transition. Now, what that means is uh, we are going now we have a lot of nuclear at duke energy and that's that's another form of clean energy but we also have coal natural gas and oil and those fossil resources uh, we're going to be transitioning away from those over time so what does that actually mean when you have to manage the electric system when you have to balance the electric system this is really all about balancing supply and demand those resources I described are what we call load following resources. Uh, it's like when you're in a vehicle that's not electric or is electric, but an, uh, an internal combustion electric vehicle. You press the accelerator down and you burn more fuel. You put it back up, you burn less fuel. So these sources automatically match the load. It makes system balancing very straightforward for us. Now we're moving to clean energy resources that are not load following resources. They're not available on demand. They're available when they are available. Sun shining, wind blowing uh, are the two biggest examples. This makes it a challenge to make sure we can balance supply and demand on the bulk electric system. So this is happening today. We're in the midst of this transition. And by the way, the bulk electric system was built for these load following resources. 
So we also have to change the way that the transmission system uh, operates and uh, the, the locations and the points that it goes to. Another thing that's happening, uh, our supply sources are much more distributed and we don't necessarily have control of all these supply resources. We have many distributed energy resources that um, provide inputs into our system. At Duke Energy, I think we have nearly 100,000 uh, rooftop solar installations that feed into the grid. And of course, there's many third party solar installations that feed into the grid. They are largely, these are take all contracts. So we take it all, all the time. Now we do have the ability to curtail those in a certain amount, in, in certain types of situations. But that's, think about that. Think about the change from load following resources. And then I'll think about weather challenges. I, I live in Charlotte. I have worked in Florida and Charlotte's in North Carolina, somewhat near the coast. I worked in Florida for Duke Energy also near the coast. Hurricanes. We have seen more hurricanes in the past 10 years than we've seen in the previous 10 years. In the previous 10 years before that, the weather is getting worse. More damage to our system is occurring because of these hurricanes. We also have seen more ice storms in our areas uh, outside of Florida, like the Carolinas and the Midwest. So this is happening. Now, customer expectations. Customer expectations are much greater today than they were, let's say, 15 to 20 years ago. I remember I worked uh, Hurricane Andrew that hit South Florida. We had customers off for four to eight weeks during Hurricane Andrew. Our customers today would never stand for that. Likely we could get four to six days before we'd get in serious trouble with our regulators. So customers expect us to be much more responsive. They expect the system to be much more resilient to damage. And they expect us to make the transition to green energy. So all of this is going on. All these challenges are going on at the same time that load is going to grow dramatically. So let that sink in a little bit. This, this is the challenge that we're working on. And it's a challenge we're going to solve. We are, I think, uh, in, in pretty good stead to resolve these challenges. Now, we have some work to do, all the electric utilities and all the different folks that support the electric utilities. Um, but it, it will require a bit of work. And I'll talk specifically now, just want to set that stage, right? Because a lot of my peers on the call are, are I want to say, much more expert than I am in their fields. I wanted to set the stage for what I see here at the electric company. Now let's talk specifically, specifically about transportation and electrification and some challenges that we see. And I'll start with residential. So residential in our territory, in Duke Energy territory, and largely in the United States, is the vast majority of that will occur at the home. Now, if you have a garage or a carport, in other words, a single family residence or a residence um, that has a place to park right in front of your home, for example, uh, it's likely that that's where that charging is going to occur. We, we estimate about 80% of the charging will occur there in the United States. We have multifamily customers, though, that we have to think about also. How are we going to serve that? You know, what type of, of charging does that look like? And that's kind of that middle picture there. Now, effects from residential charging, the way we see it, are going to vary widely depending on the current state. And the current state is changing quite a bit. You know, many, and I've got a picture of a, trans, a, a pad-mounted transformer uh, here on the, on the screen. Many of these transformers were sized 5, 10, 15 years ago when air conditioners and lighting were not as efficient as they are today. So generally, we have seen that the load profile of residential customers has gone down due to efficiencies. This will give us a little bit of room for electric vehicle charging, particularly a level one charger. That level two, we think most of our customers residential uh, will employ level two charging. There's a little bit more flexibility for them there. 
So we'll have to keep a close eye on this. I'm not as worried about the residential market as I am the small commercial uh, and the fleet market because of just what I talked about. We also will have a very good ability to control charging times. Uh, I do have the demand side management uh, group at Duke Energy. We have 1 million customers. One in seven customers at Duke Energy allows us to control their appliances like hot water heaters, air conditioners, pool pumps, for example, uh, during times of system need. A natural extension of that would be uh, electric vehicle chargers. In fact, we're looking at some opportunities where we'll make it very, very simple for our customers to give us control of those electric vehicle chargers in their homes. There's a lot of flexibility with home charging, and that's very, very important. So I'll go to commercial. Here's the things that I worry about, and it's kind of my job to worry about this uh, every day. I worry about what gas stations are gonna do here in the United States. Um, I don't envision they're just gonna give up. I see gas stations going to DC fast, char DC fast charging uh, and, and keeping, keeping the train right on going. Now, Duke Energy owns DC fast chargers. Uh, we have installed DC fast chargers and level two chargers as part of our infrastructure in multiple states. Uh, we operate electric utilities in six states uh, in the United States. But I can tell you, it's not that easy to get service to a DC fast charger, depending on the size. In fact, uh, we're installing so many of these, we're seeing shortages of certain sizes of transformers. And this is just today. Imagine when we have a very large growth uh, in what gas stations are gonna need to do. That's one example, gas stations. The, this picture here in the middle, another thing you may not think about very often, unless you have the obligation to serve like we do at the electric utility. And this is a car dealership. What does a car dealership look like for us as a load when 80% of the vehicles that are parked there are electric? This could be a challenge for us. How are they gonna charge them? How are we gonna provide the appropriate uh, electricity to charge? Can we control when they charge? We should be able to, but that's a lot of questions that need to be answered there. And then the picture here, uh, at least on the right of my screen, is just a typical small fleet operation, say a HVAC repair uh, company with five to 10 trucks, or maybe a pest control company with five to 10 trucks. It's, I would say, alarming how many of those there are out there. And eventually all of them will make the transition uh, to an electric vehicle from internal combustion engine vehicles. That means every one of these sites we're gonna to have to take a look at and determine, do we have to provide some sort of upgrade for this site? Maybe, maybe not. It depends. Each situation is gonna be unique. We envision a, a mix of level two and DC fast chargers at each one of these. And we are thinking we'll have some ability to control charging times. We won't have ability uh, on, you know, on something like what used to be a gas station with largely DC fast chargers. That won't be there, but we're certainly working to have ability to work with customers and control charging for uh, the, the uh, uh, application that you see in the middle, uh, the, the vehicle dealership uh, and the small commercial loads. So controlling charging times is really important for us. Now let's talk about fleets. This is an area that is gonna grow very quickly. We've already had several announcements, I can't tell you what they are in our territory, with loads that are alarming is probably the best way to put it. Let me give you an example of what fleet electrification looks like uh, for a typical electric utility. Many to now, these are what are called brownfield locations. It's not a brand new location uh, where, you know, we have ability to get easements and to you know, build substations or distribution or transmission lines. These locations tend to exist today and they're located in very specific regions or locations for very specific purposes. In other words, they're near an airport or they're near an interstate uh, or multiple interstates. So typically today, one of these fleet locations for us might be three to 500 kW worth of load. Three to 500 kW worth of load might be a 
a right like a typical grocery store here in the United States. And our distribution circuits, in the, in, at least in Duke's territory, and we're, if not the largest electric utility in the United States, among the largest. Uh, we have about uh, nearly 8 million electric customers. Um, our typical distribution circuit is going to max out somewhere between 10 to 15 megawatts. That's about what we're going to max out. So this 500 kW load, although, although significant, uh, is not a huge driver uh, for a typical circuit. Now, what happens when a location like this electrifies? Again, it varies. It depends on the types of vehicles, how they're going to charge them. Are they going to do slip seating? Are they able to load at night? So charge at night? A lot of different questions. But, you know, this is a fairly typical installation. It could go somewhere from 500 kW to 5 megawatts or 5,000 kW simply by changing how they operate their vehicles. And this load rolls in on wheels. It doesn't have to necessarily be constructed. Typically for us to serve a five megawatt location, 18 months to two years would be the time frame for us to acquire easements, to build the distribution circuits, potentially do substation upgrades and et cetera. It takes a while to build a load like that for us. But see, that's only part of the problem because this is what this site really looks like. It looks like that. Here's the one that we were looking at. It's on the bottom left. These fleet locations tend to cluster for obvious reasons, near the airport, again, near interstates, near locations where it's easy for them to do business. So that's a more realistic picture for us. Now envision each one of these five megawatts or four and a half megawatts worth of growth. Now you're into a new substation, or you're into significant distribution and transmission upgrades. This is a serious problem for us. We need time to build something like this. The customers here typically uh, are not used to those time frames. They're going to want us to be able to, to serve so they can meet their sustainability goals. They're going to want us to serve this load maybe a little quicker than we'll be ready to. So we've got to be innovative. I see a lot of rooftop space here for rooftop solar. I see opportunities for to put storage in. But all this takes time, engineering. And by the way, we have the obligation to serve, but we also have the obligation to serve in the most cost-effective fashion. So we need to study these installations. Here's another example and another example. This is what we're faced with. And I wanted to just, before my colleagues spoke today, just kind of lay out sort of what I see uh, here at Duke Energy uh, as the person that, uh, uh, through which the transportation electrification group at Duke reports up into. Uh, we actually are forming an organization at Duke just to deal with vehicle fleet electrification. That's how big we think this will be. And I am done with my portion of the presentation. Thank you. All right, Jay gets some sort of an award for time management. <laughs> gives me done this a few times. <laughs> it gives me hope that Duke's going to get this done. Um, so again, uh, just let me remind you to post your questions. Uh, go to slido.com. Event code is esig26, and you can post your questions there. All right, our next panelist is Nigel Turley. Nigel is the former, formerly the DSO and Future Networks Manager at Western Power Distribution in the UK. And he is now a visiting senior industrial fellow at the University of Bath in England, where he assists the engineering faculty with the development of students and research projects. His work at Western Power Distribution addressed key issues in the evolution of smart distribution grids, including scenario and capacity planning, evaluation of third party flexibility of alternatives, and development of operational and systems requirements. He chaired the Open Network Steering Group of the UK and Ireland Energy Networks Association. Uh, and so we're looking forward to this. Nigel, over to you, please. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I mean, just to give context, obviously I will be focusing on uh, GB, Great Britain, and very much on, on distribution networks rather than transmission. 
Uh, certainly here in GB, we have a very um, separated um, industry in terms of distribution, very separate from supply, actually separate ownership in most cases, and uh, transmission is separate as well. And there is currently um, ongoing debate over um, how legally separate and ownership separate the uh, overall system operator at transmission level needs to be. And that may yet mirror down into distribution. So um, there's still a lot of evolving, if you like, um, regulatory framework and legal framework going on here. Just to um, start off, I wanted to highlight, you know, really the size of the challenge we see here in GB. A um, couple of things here I've just extracted from elsewhere. One from a uh, briefing note for our MPs um, for, by the House of Commons, sort of highlighting that um, current road transport uses in the order of 500 terawatt hours of energy per year. And even with improved efficiency, we're still looking at increased electricity demand, should that all move over to electricity, of 200 terawatt hours. To put that in context, you know, current UK electricity demand is about 350 terawatt hours. So we're seeing a very substantial increase in the amount of energy. On the right there is um, a scenario that um, National Grid produce each year. They produce a series of scenarios of how the future may evolve. Picked on community renewables one here, where they're really highlighting that they believe that um, that will not reflect you know, a huge increase in maximum demand on the system due to the use of smart charging and vehicle to grid. Now, there's quite a lot of assumptions behind that, and well, let's hope it's pretty clear, you know, pretty close to what will happen, but that's probably overall system level. My concern is more distribution level, and that um, pattern could be very uneven, and we could see some very high increases in demand on some local networks, even if they're very well managed on other local networks. So, you know, the, the challenges here are to try and predict where that's going to happen. And uh, that's, I'll come back to that in terms of looking at what data we can get and what behaviours we actually see. Another sort of contextual one in terms of what's happening here in the UK. Um, on the right there is an infographic from um, our UK Climate Change Committee, which does um, effectively looks after the pathways that, and uh, what policies review of government policy to some extent in terms of how well we're on a path to, to net zero and meeting the government's objectives. It's a lot of detail on that slide, but um, I think the main issue I wanted to bring out was the change from start to finish. So, you know, that covers what, a 12 year period. And the number of charge points, we're moving from something in the order of about 18,000 charge points at the present time up to about 325,000 charge points in 12 years. And that's to support an increase in EVs from around 400,000 up to 20, just over 23 million. That's a huge increase in the number of charge points. And the rate of installation we are not meeting at the present time. Now these aren't installed by UK distributors way we work in this country is um, those charge points are in separate ownership from distribution networks. So whilst the distribution networks have the responsibility of being able to provide services to those charge points, the charge point operators are completely separate companies. So therefore, you know, control over where, when <laughs> these are needed are not within distribution companies control at all. We have to respond to that demand from those charge point providers. Well, I say at the present time, they're not being installed at a rate anywhere near needing to meet the government's target of actually allowing the decarbonisation of transport. In terms of you know how this is going to look going out, um, I mean very similar to some of what, what Jay was talking about earlier in terms of the issues at different locations. 
trying to highlight a, a few here in terms of locations. New homes, probably the easiest. Um, we can address that at the time of installation. We can size for the EVs. And we need to keep an eye on electric heating as well. We don't have much electric heating in UK. Most of it's dominated by gas. Um, some degree um, oil and some LPG in sort of tanks. Um, bit of some electric heating, but it's very much old storage heater type installations rather than heat pumps. That's certainly the direction of travel the government's pushing in is towards heat pumps. And we're certainly looking at, in terms of new housing, whether we install three phase cables, service cables, rather than single phase. To date, single phase have always been used on houses and uh, it's very rare to come across a three phase cable into a house. So, you know, that, that three phase potentially gives the opportunity for, you know, EV and home heating. You don't need to use all three phases initially, but laying that cable is a small marginal cost at that time of installation compared to upgrading it at a later point. The bigger problem is existing homes. Uh, we have a lot of different design standards when we look back over history. And uh, individual assessment is almost going to be necessary on many of these. We are trying to come up via the um, our UK Trade Association with methodologies to try and speed up this assessment process to help installers actually be able to quickly gauge whether they've got a problem, they're going to need intervention from the, from the distribution company or not. Um, at present, substandard service arrangements, in other words, ones which are below the rating that would be needed, a sort of standard rating for today, are upgraded with the costs being socialised across all customers. There has been talk of whether, as more data comes through, whether we should move to a more of a process where the person causing the issue pays for more of the upgrade. But I'm not sure that's ever going to be politically acceptable. Um, and so I think this sort of arrangement is probably going to continue going into the future. One of the bigger problems we have is on street charging. Um, awful lot of vehicles, an awful lot of vehicle owners do not have off street parking. Don't have a garage, don't have a driveway, or even a designated parking space. Just park on street, not necessarily at the same place every day either. So, therefore, you know, councils are looking at how they bring in large numbers of chargers on street to allow charging when people are at home. They're concerned about the amount of um, street furniture. Our pavements aren't usually that wide in many of our towns and cities. And so many of them are looking to upgrade existing streetlight columns to provide charge points with those. That will require network upgrades. Most of these um, streetlights are on small services or even small cable networks, just big enough to supply the street lighting. Few others, depot based fleets, again, very similar issues to, to what the chain was um, highlighting. Smart charging arrangements may give some help with this. But again, if you've got depot based fleets where they can have large numbers of vehicles there overnight needing to recharge, bus depots are typical of that, that may not be a real solution. And equally, some things like bus depots, often deep within cities, very hard, very expensive to upgrade the electricity network around them. And we're already beginning to see the, the um, use of on-site battery storage to reduce the maximum demands to uh, uh, reduce the amount of upgrade needed on networks. So those batteries can be recharged during the day when, when the chargers aren't in use very much to give that extra capacity overnight. There's other places, work street, off street parking. But again, I'll, I'll really highlight the motorway trunk road service areas. There will be a need for multiple rapid charge points. In this context, I'm really talking about charge points, yeah, 50 kilowatt plus. Fortunately, 
our regulator in the UK, Ofgem, has recognised this as an issue, along with um, UK government. And um, there is now a beginnings of a programme of strategic upgrades planned, including some of the areas where these service areas are located. Quite often our motorway service areas are in quite remote locations out in the countryside. They only have capacity at the moment for the normal supply to a, a small service station. So therefore getting in these multi megawatt upgrades is not cheap, not easy and not quick. So therefore getting ahead and starting some of that strategic reinforcement today is going to be essential. Moving on, thinking about you know, vehicle to grid and thinking back to that initial slide of how important that may be to keep overall demand on the network under control. I think the jury's still out in my mind. I mean, the technology is still in development. We've had very limited trials to date in the UK to really understand behavior or how it works. And our expectation is there will be initial focus on facilitating connections um, to actually help manage constraints on the distribution network. But that will probably evolve over time in terms of being more about energy requirements and suppliers um, you know, using that in terms of balancing their energy portfolios. And I'll come back to that in a minute because that's probably one of the issues that I find more concerning going forwards in terms of how things will work. Now, whilst you know, EV battery capacity varies considerably between different vehicle types, they're already typically getting quite large in the range of you know, 50 to 100 kilowatt hours. Hence, you know, storage can be plausibly be very large in comparison to overall electricity consumption. So I know consideration is already being given to using this storage for balancing services. And whilst, you know, that could be very effective at the GB level in terms of overall energy balancing. Clearly, coincident usage can create huge congestion issues at the local level. So that's really where my next slide takes us. Oh no, it's not, not quite. A few more yet. Data. Whenever we actually move things forward in distribution, data is usually our problem. And um, typically in history, we've used typical behaviors, templates for both planning and distribution and operating the network. In other words, if we look at history, we expect it to be repeated. If we're going to do that for EVs, we're going to need more data than we've currently got. There is some being collected already. Our work is already ongoing to establish that, but if that doesn't work, we need even more data in terms of charge status, journey plans, charging intentions, all those sorts of things. Brings a whole heap of privacy issues in terms of where that data comes from, how it's handled, how it's stored. In terms of you know, costs, chart here from one of the uh, larger distribution companies, Western Power Distribution, just showing the timescales and costs that customers will incur as things go forward. As you can see, once you get up to the rapid chargers, the costs start rising quite rapidly for end customers. And uh, that can be a real challenge going forwards in terms of how that's managed. Now, I mentioned um, a couple of times sort of things I'm rather concerned about in terms of to some extent conflict across the industry. Um, as I said, here in GB, we've got a very um, separated industry between distribution, supply, generation, and end metering is a supply responsibility. It's not with distribution, and that does cause some real issues in terms of data transfer because um, the privacy responsibility is with suppliers, and they're very um, concerned about releasing such data to distributors. So therefore we do have a, a shortage of, of data in some of these areas. But in terms of what's happening, we're already seeing tariffs that are targeted at EV charging. 
even to the extent of charging being free at certain times from some suppliers. Now, these are likely to target times of high renewable output as we go forwards. And hence, those charging periods could end up with a high coincidence. That's not great for distribution networks. We would favour diversified charging. What we haven't really got to yet is how to do some real whole system analysis on this to understand the best commercial arrangements to get the best of both worlds. Now, what will give the overall lowest cost to customers, even if those costs fall on certain parts of the industry, and then the regulator will need to recognize that and adjust the pricing mechanisms to allow that to actually work. Part of the problem with doing that whole system analysis is to get it right, we're going to need a lot of data, quite a lot of which we haven't got much data on or confidence in the data we do have. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of work to go on here in terms of getting this right going forwards. So, just to sort of summarise, you know, the impact of EVs on distribution networks, as Jay was highlighting as well, will be very significant in terms of going forwards and what's going to happen. To some extent, unfortunately, solutions are not common across all locations. So it will vary from the use of smart technology through to major upgrades, traditional upgrades, digging holes in the road and constructing things. The development of sort of data collection, the analytics of that data are going to be needed to get us to um, target investment in the best way and timely so that we're not in the way of the growth of EVs. And the industry will need to work together even more than it does now to find solutions to the potential conflict cases where you know, distributors want things distributed out and suppliers may want to group it because it needs to get, they need it to get that energy balance right. Having said that, we're going to probably have to try and come up with some sort of template solution. The resources needed to go down bespoke on every case are too large. We are not going to have the people or resources or time to get that right. And then finally, just a slight word of warning, that's slightly out of date, that bullet point. UK government did publish its heat strategy last week. Um, and it does look at substantial electrification use of heat pumps. Timescales are probably a bit different to EVs though. Um, you can still install a gas boiler in this country, probably up to 2035. Whether people will want to, in terms of the way costs of energy might move between gas and electricity, there's another question. Government is already talking about moving a lot of the environmental subsidies, which are currently on electricity, across to gas. That could change the people's decision as to how quickly they move to electric heating of some form. And that could add, yet again, another, you know, probably more than 200 terawatt hours per year in terms of heat load onto the network. Again, the demand will probably be pretty coincident in terms of times of cold weather. Okay, thank you. That's all I've got to say. All right, another thank you, uh, Bern, for time management. Pretty much bang on time there, Nigel. Thank you very much. So, um, we move on to our next speaker, and again, I will remind you to post your questions to slido.com, event code ESIG26. Our next panelist is Francisco Boschel, who leads on innovation for renewable energy technologies at the International Renewable Energy Agency, IRENA. Francisco's current work focuses on technology development strategies for wider deployment of renewable energy systems, his 18 years of experience includes, among other things, consulting on renewable and energy efficiency projects for the former Kima consulting firm, now known as DNVGL, and designing and implementing infrastructure and energy-related projects for General Motors, obviously very relevant to today's conversation. Francisco is a mechanical engineer with a master's degree from the University of Eindhoven in the Netherlands. 
Francisco, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Michael, and thank you for the organizers to invite, uh, for inviting Irina to contribute to this event to share our view on uh, what is needed to have a smart charging uh, approach for electric vehicles. Uh, next slide, please. And let me start with what we have observed in the last three years that we have been supporting our member countries in the field of electrifying road transport. Well, clearly more and more countries are committed to accelerate the transition towards electromobility. Already we have around 11 million electric vehicles on the road uh, around the globe and Europe has now taken the lead in the market which used to have China till the last year and with battery technology at the core we also see the growing number of announcements on about close to 200 new battery gigafactories in the pipeline between now and 2030 that's huge mainly in China but also in the US and Europe and we also see the increased focus on deploying charging infrastructure, particularly uh, public charging points. This is basically led by China uh, with more than 800,000 uh, public charging points. But globally, we have around 1.3 million public charging points available uh, by the end of, of last year. However, what we do not see yet so much is the discussion on the impact between or the synergies between electromobility power systems and renewable deployment at the forefront of the policy agenda. And even less, for example, on a specific uh, niche technologies like vehicle to grid deployment. That is still missing from that uh, high level policy debate. Next slide, please. But what is clear is that the electromobility trend is getting more and more momentum. And in Irina's projections aligned with that 1.5 degree Paris agreement scenario, we consider that we may need around 380 million passenger electric vehicles on the road by 2030 and around 1.8 billion electric vehicles by 2050. That's what is shown on the, on the graph on the left side. And that would require around 180 million charging points by 2030 and close to 1 billion by 2050. Out of those, more or less two thirds would be installed at home and one third um, at, at public uh, charging points. And from a power system perspective, that would also mean that we may have more than 50 terawatt hours of battery storage capacity in those vehicles that perhaps could be used for grid balancing services. That would be almost three times what we estimate would be needed for balancing services from uh, for utility scale and behind the meter batteries by 2050. So really, if we find a way to use those storage capacity in a smart way, that will really dwarf the uh, stationary battery applications for uh, flexibility services. Next slide, please. But how can we unlock this potential and what is needed to implement a smart charging approach where electric vehicles may become a source of flexibility instead of an additional constraint to the system. Well, clearly we need what we call a systemic approach. So technology innovation concerning a battery and charging technology digitalization is key, but that must be accompanied by innovations in market regulation in business models and in the way that power systems are operated. Next slide, please. And the other nuance is that we won't have one smart approach that works in every segment of electromobility. So in our ongoing analysis on the topic, we are working now on a new story on smart electrification for the transport sector that will be published uh, early next year. We are looking into smart strategies for five different segments. Two and three wheelers, very relevant, especially for developing countries. The other one is passenger cars. The other one is light duty vehicles. The other one is heavy duty vehicles, trucks, and the other one is public buses. And because each segment has different conditions that impact the design of the smart charging approach, we look, for example, at the duration and the time when the vehicles are parked, the locations, 
uh, where they can be charged, the nom nominal capacity needed per charging point, for example, from three to seven kilowatts at home to 150 kilowatts and above for ultra fast charging, and even ongoing discussions of megawatt scale charging points for electric trucks. So all of these make it even more complicated, and we need to really understand each one of these segments separately. Next slide, please. In, actually, that's why also in 2011, uh, we published our first analysis on a smart charging for electric vehicles, looking just at the passenger car segment. And we described the different approaches for a smart charging from a basic time of use par, uh, pricing signals without automated control to uh, B1G technology and even to be uh, vehicle to grid approaches with automated control by the uh, system operator. And of course, uh, the different options, as we go more sophisticated, they get more complex and also more costly to implement, but also they unlock much more flexibility to the system than the basic ones. Next slide, please. And then we also did, uh, as many of you now, I think, our own modeling exercise to better understand the impact of such advanced charging approach on a few distribution system archetypes. And this uh, colorful table that you see here compares the results of our model, the first one, Irina's model, we use Plexus for that, with other models that were available in 2019. And all were kind of consistent. So clearly smart charging reduces the peak load by at least half in most of these cases, but the benefit is even more pronounced in a PV dominated systems than in wind dominated system. And that is because wind is more evenly distributed along the day. The smart charging also allows for higher shares of low cost PV, therefore displacing more costly units in the uh, margin, potentially reducing prices, electricity prices. And we also model a uh, mobility as a service scenario with autonomous driver, where the flexibility, of course, was significantly reduced, basically, as in this case, the vehicles are not really parked 90% 90, 90 of the time anymore, and are charged in hubs instead of at home, a more uh, a scatterly distributed. And in the back of the slides uh, of this presentation and in our reports, you can find the details, uh, detailed results from these modeling exercises, also another that we have from Beijing City and other exercises we have collected from around the globe. Next slide, please. We also look at the consumer's behavior. And in the most advanced EV market at the moment, which was Norway, the good news was that EV owners tend to charge at home with the slow charging points, which is very well suited for a smart charging approach. However, in countries with lower penetration of detached housing rates, but more large multi-occupancy buildings, the situation is quite different with more charging uh, done in public uh, charging points and more demand for fast charging uh, applications, which is not really friendly with a smart charging approach. Next slide, please. And as mentioned before, uh, looking, we look at a systemic approach. So we also look at the key regulatory and business model aspects to be considered to facilitate this smart charging of passenger EVs. And for example, in regulation, it's critical to have these dynamic tariffs, also important to create flexibility markets uh, for low voltage services, especially congestion at low voltage grids, allow also electric vehicles to bid for multiple services to stack revenues, also avoid doubly leveling uh, when you charge and discharge uh, your car. And of course, having building codes that already request, re request new buildings to be smart charging ready. And in terms of business models, the use of digital technologies to aggregate uh, electric vehicles is quite important because the trade capacity usually for these services is more than five megawatts. You cannot trade really kilowatt scale. And also the need, of course, to consider, okay, how fast these batteries might be degraded uh, based on depending on the different type of services and how this can be compensated to the car owner. So those are some of the elements also uh, required from a regulatory and business model perspective. Next slide, please. And uh, in our analysis, we have also been discussing this with uh, the utilities and some industrial players to which always highlight the importance of digital solutions. And I'm focusing on European examples as today we have greatest speakers from, from the US. But for example, 
the DSO of Hamburg, uh, Stromnetz Hamburg, they analyzed in 2019 the alternatives to reduce the impact of their distribution grid if 9% of the car stocks in the city would be electrified. One option was to just uh, reinforce the grid that may cost around 20 million euros, but that, uh, and the option B, sorry, would be a smart digital solution to uh, compensate the owner to allow a remote control by the system operator of the uh, um, power uh, to charge the vehicle and the time when it is charged. And of course, the investment is of one order of magnitude. The grid reforms would be around 20 million euros investment, the digital solution, 2 million euros investment. But more than that, what they were saying is, look, the money is, is important, but the real challenge, as I think Jay from Duke was mentioning, is the time. Can you imagine that we need to change 10,000 kilometers of, uh, of uh, cable lines, change transformers, which in Hamburg, many are located in the basement of houses. You know? That would be months and months of uh, roads which are closed, et cetera. So it's not just about the money, it's all the complexity to really make this uh, work. So a digital solution clearly much more preferred. Next slide, please. And now they have moved actually to implementation. And two years later, now in 2021, they are implementing this digital solution, which now is, is presented as the e-round. And they are not only doing it uh, for electric passenger cars, but also for fleets of uh, light duty uh, vehicles and even considering in the port heavy duty vehicles. Next slide, please. And our uh, member countries are also asking us now more about the heavy duty segment, where of course we have different options to decarbonize uh, trucks, uh, batteries, uh, hydrogen, uh, biofuels. But clearly we see that battery trucks are getting more attention. Two years ago, there was no much attention to battery trucks. It was heavy duty trucks. It was mainly discussion about hydrogen or advanced biofuels. But battery technology has uh, uh, developed so fast that now battery uh, trucks are now uh, gaining momentum quite rapidly. Next slide, please. And uh, well, some key considerations is that, for example, heavy duty trucks actually dominate in terms of uh, the uh, commercial uh, transportation of duty uh, of uh, uh, cargo. Also that, uh, for example, in the case of Europe, actually uh, the, these trucks do not uh, travel more than 500 km kilometers in one journey, which is already offered by many electric trucks uh, manufacturers. The extra weight of the battery is minor as you reduce weight because of the uh, uh, you don't have diesel and the internal combustion engines are also more uh, heavy. So all of these, uh, the enhancement in battery, et cetera, so all of these uh, improvements are now creating the case for electric trucks. And actually we expect again in a Paris Agreement Alliance scenario that we may have more than 9 million heavy duty trucks by 2030 and more than 60 million heavy duty trucks by 2050. Next slide, please. But of course, as mentioned before, this segment is very different than the passenger car segment. The charging capacity is very different. It's been uh, discussed even megawatts charging points. The investment is quite different just to upgrade one service station along the highways, for example, in France may cost more than 1 million euros in cables and posts. The planning time also mentioned by Jay from Duke, they need at least one to three years to plan and implement these upgrades. The regulation also because uh, e-trucks are not so sensitive to dynamic pricing of as passenger cars because they really have fixed times where they can charge their cars and the location. They can charge, of course, at home, but they have charging hubs, either in depot, resting areas, etc. Next slide, please. So what we see, and this is taken from ABB, is kind of a, a incremental approach on this flexibility. So the first step is okay for these charging hubs in depots or resting areas is the approach of don't blow the fuse. So basically, uh, try to uh, accommodate the, or avoid the simultaneity just uh, as much as possible in a controlled manner. But then the peak, shape, peak shaving approach where we add stationary batteries next to these charging points to, to uh, avoid or manage this peak shaving. And then a more comprehensive site energy optimization where we also include, as mentioned by Nigels before, uh, the synergies with other flexibility options, with generation profiles, et cetera, all of that uh, utilizing digital technology, of course. 
Next slide, please. And of course, uh, that would make the uh, smart charging approach for e-trucks very different to a smart charging approach for passenger cars. We need to better understand their charging patterns. These solutions might be more relying on infrastructure, digital or electrical, than on price signals. Uh, batteries as buffers might be quite important, and also the combination of on-site renewal generation with charging hubs, like done in some cases, this is done, for example, in Frito Lane, California, or also Calistine funds, where they are combining this on-site generation in charging points. And of course, the proper planning, because all of this takes a lot of time. Next slide, please. Okay, and finally, three key technology trends So for trucks. Now we are discussing about, or the, the technology providers like ABB are discussing about charging points of one megawatt up to three megawatts. Uh, you see in the picture uh, on the top uh, left corner, this is actually a, char a person charging uh, in a one megawatt. You see the thickness of the cable because they have liquid to cool the cable, otherwise he, he will be, his hands will be burned <laughs> because of the, uh, the currency, so of the current, sorry. So, these technologies are being developed, but the question is, do we actually need those? And in the case of Europe, for example, what is seen is that more than half of the potential charging points are areas where uh, the driver has more than three hours uh, to wait. So maybe there is not such a big market yet for these very high uh, nominal capacity charging points. Next slide, please. The other discussion we have uh, a lot in Europe is about electric road systems or catenary or pantograph uh, trucks. And uh, this is interesting because they are proposing kind of a hybrid system where the trucks in some segments of the highway can be uh, charged with these catenaries. In some areas, there will be no catenary, so the, the, the pantograph just uh, hide itself. And it's combined with a stationary charging points, uh, depots, rest areas, etc. That may help, of course, because then you don't have a simultaneity of charging in, in the hubs, but you have more distributed um, uh, charging of these trucks. And even the trucks might, be, might have a, a smaller uh, batteries. Also, you can piggyback on, for example, a standards already developed in the ICPC9 for this kind of system for railway systems. So there are some interesting aspects, and actually countries like Sweden and Germany are already including this solution uh, in their portfolio for the truck uh, uh, decarbonization, and they are testing this technology. Next slide, please. And finally, of course, the case of battery swapping. This is, for example, the case of e-buses in Xingdao in, in China, where this is already been implemented they can, uh, uh, let's say, replace the batteries of around 500 buses per day. And of course, uh, these uh, uh, systems allow uh, a much better management of this uh, charging of, of these batteries because basically they are stationary batteries there uh, with the system operator. So this is also another interesting approach being tested basically in China. Of course, this work more for captive fleets than for, for example, passenger cars. But this is something also interesting in the case, for example, of uh, city buses. Next slide, please. Well, and as mentioned before, we always need this systemic approach looking at technology, regulation, system operation, and innovation in business models. Next slide, please. Okay, with that, I would like to finalize. Thank you so much. And if you are interested, you can go to our uh, website and download our uh, reports which are uh, sourced in, in each slide of my presentation, also in the back of the slides for free, and uh, look more closely to the analysis we have conducted in the last three years. Thank you so much. Well, in addition to being fascinating, our panel is, uh, is rapidly uh, competing for the, the best time managed panel I think I've ever been participating in, so congratulations to all. Um, once again, a reminder to post your questions to slido.com, event code ESIG26. Our final panelist for today's discussion is Dr. Matteo Muratori of the National Renewable Energy Laboratory in Golden, Colorado, NREL, where he leads a team exploring uh, system level solutions for the transformation of the transportation sector 
and its synergies with the electricity grid. He is also the chief analyst for sustainable transportation for the US Department of Energy. Dr. Moratori holds undergraduate and graduate degrees in en energy engineering from Politecnico di Milano and graduate degrees in mechanical engineering and statistics from the Ohio State University. He will present the findings of an NREL study recently conducted on heavy duty truck elect electrification. Mateo, the floor is all yours. Awesome. Thank you much for the introduction, Mike. And can you hear me well and see my screen? I can hear you. Awesome. Thank you. And so let me start by giving a brief introduction of NREL, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. For those of you not familiar with us, uh, we are part of the Department of Energy Complex of National Labs. We're located in, in Golden, uh, in Colorado. And our major focus is renewable energy and energy efficiency. When you look at this pie chart here on the right, this is the breakdown of US greenhouse gas emissions in 2019, just, just before the COVID pandemic hit us. And, and you see there, Transportation is about a third of the overall emissions in the country today. Uh, so it's clear that to achieve our ambitions in terms of climate change mitigation and, and solving the climate crisis, we do need to carb transportation emissions and we do, we do need to do that rapidly and we do need to do that across all different transportation modes. Uh, usually, when we think about vehicle electrification, our mind tends to focus on light duty vehicles, you know, the, the Teslas that we see uh, running around in our streets. Today, I wanted to focus on medium and heavy duty vehicles. Uh, after hearing all the talks, I know a lot of the panelists had the same thoughts to, today. So, we all talk a lot about medium and heavy duty vehicles, but that's what I'll be focusing on. It's the second largest slice uh, when you break down transportation, it's over 20% of, of greenhouse gas emissions, is a major source of local air pollutants, these vehicles are usually powered by, by diesel engines, and air pollutants uh, negatively impact urban air quality, human health, and really disproportionately affect disadvantaged communities that are usually located near freight corridors, near ports or distribution centers. So, so a lot of uh, pressing reasons to mitigate these emissions. Uh, one way of reducing uh, uh, emissions from medium and heavy duty vehicles is electrification. We see zero emission vehicles, including both battery as well as fuel cell, uh, hydrogen fuel cell electric vehicles, offering a pathway to decarbonize transportation. And while these vehicles are still at a limited stage of commercial deployment today, we are seeing very rapidly growing opportunities. The, the technology has advanced very rapidly, especially on the battery electric vehicle uh, uh, in the battery electric vehicle uh, arena. And so we really see these vehicles uh, becoming available very, very quickly. Um, it's important to, to understand when we talk about medium and heavy duty vehicles that these are not two monolithic blocks. Now, of course, medium and, and heavy duty vehicles are different, but even within the medium and the heavy duty classes, these vehicles are driven and operated very differently, which means that the opportunities to decarbonize and electrify those vehicles and then the charging needs and the impact on the grid are going to be very different. So in this figure, what you see here is for medium on the top bars and then for heavy, the class seven and class eight semi-truck uh, vehicles, you see the breakdown of those vehicles on the left and the energy that they consume on the right based on their primary operating range. I think one, one misconception often on, on heavy duty vehicles especially is imagining these big semi-trucks just driving along the, the highways day and night and, and, and crunching as many miles as possible. Well, some of those trucks do uh, operate, are, are operated that way and do drive a very high number of miles every day and every year, but a lot of those vehicles don't. Uh, for example, here are some statistics, uh, about 10% of heavy duty trucks trucks have an operating range that is uh, greater than 500 miles, but over 70% operate within 100 miles. And although the energy use is skewed towards the vehicle that are driven more, because they're driven more, we see that about 40% of energy is actually used by trucks that operate within 100 miles. Uh, this data is actually fairly dated uh, too. This is this is from a data source called Vius that, that was lastly conducted in 2002. And we're seeing major shifts that happened in, in how the industry is operated. Over the last 10 years, 
the average length that a track travels at, has decreased by about 37% according to, to ATRI. And so th this is not even factual, factored in in this figure. We see that there is a lot of opportunity for this, you know, what we call short haul operation, these tracks that are driven a, a lower amount of mileage. And so, of course, these different tracks are used differently, are operated differently, and we think that different solutions are going to be the best fit to decarbonize these tracks. Uh, what we notice is that in this commercial application, uh, really economics drive adoption of technology, and a lot more than what happens for light duty vehicles. And so, so our expectation is that once a tipping point is hit, once you know battery electric or fuel cell trucks becomes cheaper than diesel trucks, then uh, you know the adoption is going to scale up very rapidly. Uh, here you see some results from a recent report. I'll, I'll, I'll show the slides at the end of the presentation, so you have the links and you can see up all, all the sources. Uh, but, but this report shows how battery electric vehicle can be uh, cost competitive for uh, applications that are 300 miles of range or less. And we estimated that's about 60% of the truck energy usage uh, falls within that category. You also see on the far right hand side how fuel cell vehicles can be cost competitive in the future in an in a, in application that requires 500 or more mi miles of range. Important to also recognize that biofuels can also help address some of the uh, limitations that we that we incur and, and mitigate some of the emissions from these trucks, especially for, for legacy fleet and as the fleet turnover is going to take a significant amount of time. So, so for the rest of the talk today, I'm really going to focus on the battery electric vehicles and uh, on the short haul application, those trucks that do not drive a, a high number of miles every day. So this 60% of energy use that I was, I was talking about, but I think it's important to, to consider the whole picture here. When we talk about decarbonizing transportation, it's not going to be a single silver bullet. It's not going to be a single solution. There is a lot of variability and, and we need to keep that in mind when we think about our solutions. So, as I said, we wanted to do a deeper dive in this sort of short haul application for electric vehicles, because we think that these are the, early, the, the, the earliest application that we're going to see in the market. This is the, in a sense, the low hanging fruit when it comes to electrifying um, uh, heavy duty applications. So we teamed up with two uh, electric utilities, Encore and Southern Company. You see here are our team members, and we started looking at what would it take to electrify these vehicles and what would it be the impact on distribution systems. All the results that we, we produced in this work were published in this paper, was published a few months ago in Nature Energy. I, I, again, I'm sharing the slides, but here you have a link to the paper. All the data that I'm showing today, all the figures and all the insights that we generated is publicly available for you to download and possibly use in some of your studies, as well as the code that was used to generate this data that, that's freely available on GitHub for you to use. So the first step for us when we started looking at this was to understand how the trucks are used. So we took uh, data from our fleet DNA uh, repository and we look at 20, 2100 operating days. So, so fairly significant data set. And we, we selected three different fleets to, to analyze in our analysis. When you look at those uh, uh, bars there on the on the bottom right hand side here of the slide, you see fleet one, fleet two, and fleet three really map to this low mileage applica application. Fleet, fleet one and two are on average less than 50 miles a day in terms of operating range, and fleet three is, is between 50 and 100 miles of range. So, so to, to say this differently, vehicles in fleet one and two drive between 20 and 30,000 miles a year, and vehicles in fleet three drive between 30 and 40,000 miles a year. Again, short haul application, but when you compare those to the distribution of how vehicles are used, you see a lot of vehicles are actually used this way. This is a significant portion of the truck population and the energy that is used by, by uh, heavy duty trucks. So the first thing that we looked at uh, was trying to understand, hey, how much are these truck driven every day. You know, we have this very highly resolved data set where, where day by day we collect uh, data at a one second res resolution and we and we really get a, to, to get to look deeply at how the vehicles are used. What you see here is how much vehicles are driven across all the days that we consider the 2100 uh, days that we do we had access uh, to and how much charging was available. How much time was available for charging at their vehicle primary depot. So this is where the vehicle usually spend their night, their overtime. 
And, and what you see there is again, the distribution of, of miles is pretty consistent. Fleet one and two is consistently below 200 miles a day. There was no day that, that, that made an exception there. A 200 mile range would have satisfied every single day in the data set. Fleet 3 has a little bit more variability, uh, but we see that 90% of days are below 300 miles and 99% and are below 500 miles. There is, there is one day that was actually an, an exception. And we also see a very significant opportunity for depot charging. What you see there on the, on the right hand side is number of hours per day that the truck is parked at their depot. You see, uh, in excess of 12 hours for most of the days. So that, that basically tells us that there is a lot of opportunity to charge these vehicles. There, there are a lot of choices that this fleet can make on how they're gonna use this time to complete uh, vehicle charging. These charging load profiles that you see here, which again are freely available for you to download in case you wanted to do a grid integration study, for example, and you need the load shapes for, for trucks. These, these are possible load shapes that you could use uh, from our study. Really, really articulate this, this uh, point that I was talking about. These trucks can be charged in very different ways. Uh, we have three scenarios here, uh, charge at high power as soon as possible, charge as, at high power as late as possible, the 100 kilowatt delayed, or charge them at a constant minimum power, which basically means as whenever the truck is at their depot and, and is not being used, and, and this is not during breaks during the day, it's like when, when, the, when a truck is at the depot for, for a significant amount of time, then we just assume that it gets charged and we look at what is the power level that is required to complete charging in that scenario. You see, when you look at, this, at these load shapes, very different uh, shapes, very different peaks. You know, when a truck is charged as quickly as possible at a high power level, yeah, for, for 10, just 10 vehicles, we're looking at, at 400 kilowatt or more. And when, when you look at the constant minimum power, we can reduce that to well below 200 kilowatt. So, so great opportunity to reduce peak load by leveraging all this time that vehicles are parked at this uh, different depot. The other aspect that we looked at is uh, EVSCs, the charging station, the chargers that are needed to supply power to these vehicles. You hear a lot of talks about multi-megawatt charging, which we think, is, which is something that, that, that we, are, we are working on, we are investing in, and we, which is something that we think is important for long haul applications. But when it comes to these short haul trucks, what we find here is that the charging power level that are required to, to charge these vehicles are much lower than what we usually talk about when we talk about commercial vehicles. You know, for fleet one and two, we're really talking 16 and 23 kilowatt. Like this, this is what, uh, this is this is level two uh, charging, you know, level two uh, taps off at 20 actually. So, so it's almost level two charging. It's much lower power levels than what we usually talk about. Even for fleet three, which is the, the fleet that drives a little bit more, a, a little bit longer uh, trips, we're talking about 100 kilowatt per vehicle being sufficient to fully recharge every single vehicle under every single condition in all of the data we considered without assuming any change to the way that the vehicle are, are operated today. And, and today these are diesel trucks. So, so here there is no consideration of the vehicle actually being an electric vehicle. So, so we, 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 we thought this was a pretty significant insight when we think about what a kind of equipment needs to be installed to, to provide charging to these, to these vehicles. And then we started looking at, you know, what happens to distribution systems? How do we accommodate charging? So, so this is just a scheme of what we looked at. So, so starting from the right hand side, you know, the vehicle, the charging stations, and then all the way to the on-site equipment, like the, the meters that might need to be upgraded and then distribution feeders and all the way to distribution substations. We did not look at transmission and generation system in the study. We really only focus on the, on the distribution side of the power system. And we produce this table together with our with our uh, industry uh, colleagues and as well as a, a number of other external experts to try and understand, you know, how much would it cost and how long would it take to upgrade different components of the system to accommodate different levels of uh, EV adoption. Uh, so, so I think Jay mentioned this at the beginning. One one important aspect that we really found here is the timeline. Uh, it, it, you know. Upgrading distribution systems is going to cost money, and I think we, we all understand that. And, and here you have some quantification of that, how much uh, upgrading the different 
parts of the power system in the United States is going to cost or, or, or on average. But the timeline is also a critical element here. You see, to, to install a new substation, we're talking about years. And so, so one of the one of the things that I wanted to, to mention, uh, and, and I think Jay mentioned this as well in this talk, is you know, when we when 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 fleet owners think about fleet electrification, keeping in mind these timelines is critical. This is not just ordering a truck and when the truck shows up, it's ready to go. We we need to make sure that there is heavy coordination between fleets and power systems and, and utilities so that the distribution system is ready to accommodate those vehicles. And then our colleagues at Encore did a pretty deta detailed study at the substation level to understand how many substations would need uh, to be upgraded and what kind of upgraded are needed uh, to accommodate EV charging. Uh, what we found is that uh, adding about 100 vehicles to a distribution feeders, uh, all charging at 100 kilowatt, so, so our more pessimistic scenario, so without doing charge uh, management, uh, led to about 20% of substation needed to be upgraded in, in our uh, in, in, in Encore service territory. Uh, and this can be reduced by about 10%, so it can be cut in half if vehicles are charged at what we call the, char the minimum um, power level, so, so our smart charge management protocol. So, so a very significant impact on distribution system here. We, we, with managed charging, we can really cut in half the amount of substation that need to be upgraded to accommodate uh, vehicle electrification. So I'm going to try to follow my colleagues here and be, and be good on time. A quick summary on insights. You know, a lot of heavy trucks drive fairly low daily mileage and offer multiple charging options and opportunities. Uh, we see that short haul operation for heavy duty vehicles might be electrifiable at low power level, leveraging the extensive period of time that they are uh, that they are part of their depot. And this depot charging really provides a lot of load flexibility. This enables peak demand to be reduced, uh, which reduces you know, electricity costs, especially if there are demand charges, it reduces equipment cost, and it reduces impact on the power system. So, so it's really a win-win-win situation for, for everyone. Uh, important to remember that distribution system upgrades, especially substation, are costly, but perhaps more importantly than that are time consuming. So, so it's really important to engage utilities early on in, the, in this process when we think about electrification. And uh, last but not least, we see a lot of variability. So, so here we looked at short haul operation of heavy duty trucks. You know, trucks that are used for long haul operations are going to need different solutions, perhaps not even electrification, perhaps high uh, power charging. Uh, so, so uh, I think we, we in transportation we are used to to a really a single fuel. We're used to petroleum, like supplying all the energy needs across all single modes, all sim single applications, and and we need to to start realizing that 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 silver bullet is not going to exist in the future we're going to need a plethora of solutions and, and we're going to have to study what the solutions look like. Uh, to conclude, uh, a, 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 an important aspect that we try to really focus on a lot at NREL, uh, on top of, of course, understanding that vehicle electrification is, is a rapidly emerging uh, topic, is the need for more nuanced demand-side modeling to assess what EV charging needs and flexibilities are. So, so the study that I that I showed you today is one example. You know, these these vehicles are really used in different ways. We need to we need to understand clearly how the vehicle are used. What are the needs? What are the opportunities to to charge these vehicles in a flexible way? How can we change vehicle charging to accommodate and support grid uh, transformation? Uh, really, th there is a lot of need for looking at the demand side and the supply side in an, in in an integrated way. And, and ultimately, I think in transportation, we're really used to think about how much energy is going to take to move a good from point A to point B. But, but with electrification, it's not just how much energy, it's also when and where that energy is consumed. These load shapes are critically important. And so, so there needs to be a lot more attention paid to, to modeling uh, how, these, uh, how these future vehicles might be operated and charged to understand then how do we effectively integrate them with the system. And what we're seeing is a lot of opportunities for synergistically deploying electric vehicles and renewables and integrated to technologies. A lot of complementarities there, a lot of services that vehicles can do uh, to support the grid. And then 
a few references here for, for those of you interested in more details. Again, all the data that, that I showed today uh, is publicly available. Feel free to reach out to me if you have a problem or, or have time finding it, and I'll be happy to share everything uh, with you guys. And, and I'll stop there and look forward to the uh, group discussion. All right. Well, we're knocking it out of the park today, or hitting it for six, as Nigel would say. Um, if uh, the panelists could please uh, activate their uh, videos, uh, that would be helpful. Um, so uh, we had a, a lot of good questions, um, and uh, as as Charlie said at the outset, um, or as Charlie warned us at the outset, we'll certainly not get to all of them or anywhere close to all of them, and. So we'll try to prioritize, but uh, be assured that uh, all of the panelists will be given an opportunity to re respond and all of the questioners, hopefully, will get some answers to their questions. Um, so uh, following, uh, I guess I'd summarize the four presentations we heard as, as um, big challenges, big opportunities um, to, to meet those challenges. Um, I'll um, I'll observe a democratic approach to this and, and pick the most popular question first, which is a big open ended question and I'll put it first uh, to uh, the 2 panelists who have who are or have been at the at the rock face with regulators uh, to give their views. But then I'll, I'll offer uh, Francisco and Mateo the opportunity to chip in as well. Uh, the question, which came from an anonymous poster, uh, is um, what do you think is the role for policymakers in supporting grid readiness and infrastructure, distribution grid readiness and infrastructure, and what regulatory changes might be needed to meet the existing goals? Uh, so, Jay, let's start with you, and then we can go to Nigel. Well, I think there's a significant role for policymakers, and we're seeing it right now. Uh, you know. Policy around the, the clean energy transition, policy around carbon, all of that is is helping to, you know, to drive us in the right direction here. What I'm more involved with is policy with our uh, regulators. Uh, Duke is a regulated electric utility in uh, six states. We operate eight electric utilities in six states. I know that sounds strange, but that's how it is. Um, and uh, every one of them has different rate cases, different rate case timing. Uh, and I represent the company in those rate cases as an expert witness for transmission and distribution operations. And I can tell you, this needs to be explained to the regulators. We need to go make a case for early investment in infrastructure so we're ready as these transitions take place. And they, it shouldn't be traditional infrastructure per se, but we need to leverage our opportunities with solar or opportunities with storage uh, at the edge where the load is. So I think without the regulators understanding what some of these issues are, particularly for fleet electrification, we will have a hard time dealing with it. Um, in some jurisdictions, we can't even work on our system until we have a firm load commitment from customers. And while that's good for certain types of load, it is not good for electric vehicles. It is not good for TE. We need to prepare for this well in advance of announcements, for lack of a better term. So, yeah, we need to work with our regulators very closely and go make a case. Nigel? I mean, I'd echo many of those points. I mean, I think perhaps slight differences, certainly our regulator off chairman in, in the UK has, has a very strong um, understanding of the issues, their concern is purely one of how they keep control of bills. Really, in terms of, you know, that they're worried about stranded investment. And when we talk about strategic investment being needed, their big concern is we're going to build and it's not going to get used. So, we do have this problem constantly of, yep, they will probably approve the expenditure required, but will they approve it in time? And that's where, you know, strategic reinforcement really does get needed in certain places. I mean, I have to say, they have actually come forward and allowed us a degree of strategic reinforcement to be done now. Uh, but it's really around places where it's more certain it's going to be needed. So, motorway service areas, you know, trunk road stations, that's where 
the initial work is being done, but we're going to need it much more than that across the whole network and um, actually getting that agreement is going to be difficult. And also in UK, I mean, it's, we have price controls once every five years. So you've got to make most of your case once every five years, looking forward to five years. That's not easy in current circumstances. And uh, whilst the regulator is putting in uncertainty mechanisms that will allow sort of reopeners part way through to allow extra expenditure, often that becomes too late. It can be quite a cumbersome process, the whole reopening something to, to approve more expenditure. And um, whether that be quick enough, don't know. I'm dubious that it would be. I think we need other mechanisms to allow that investment to take place more rapidly. Uh, thanks, Nigel. Uh, Matteo or Francisco, maybe more in the direction of policymakers rather than regulators. Any any thoughts to offer? Maybe maybe I'll add two quick thoughts here, um, Mike. Well. One, I think uh, we, we have all heard about the massive investment being proposed in terms of EV charging infrastructure. And so, so that's clearly something that policymaker can do. Um, and, and, and I think it's going to make a, a lot of impact. Um, a, a, another element, and, and I, I agree with everything that, that, that Jay and, uh, um, and Nigel has, has said so far, uh, but, but another aspect that we need to start thinking about is how the power markets are fundamentally going to change as end consumers become more integrated. And so, for example, EVs can provide services for the grid. And when I think about distribution system, often those services aren't really priced explicitly. So, so for example, if an EV is provide support to, to support voltage regulation, like that's, 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 that's just not reflected in consumers' bills. And so how, how do we value that service? How do we make sure that we engage consumers so that we can exploit this flexibility to do what's what what the grid needs? I think I think we have mechanisms with 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 electricity pricing to do that at, at some sort of to the to the bulk power system level, but distribution services aren't really fully priced uh, in today's market, and, and we need to start thinking about that. That's going to be a big change uh, in the future if we want to fully exploit this resource. Maybe to add. Uh... So from a policy perspective, for example, something that uh, is missing and we are trying to promote is the discussion between the different uh, authorities in, in the country. So we see the discussion on electromobility only from the transport authorities, while the issues about infrastructure from the energy authorities. And what we have been trying to do with our member countries is to have joint dialogues where the uh, transport, climate, and energy authorities uh, have a dialogue to plan because it's important, for example, uh, where these uh, charging points, public charging points, will be installed, where they will be promoted to be installed, where they will be needed, where will be then the uh, needed expansion of the of the grid, etc., to those locations. And there is, a, we see, a lack of dialogue between these different um, policy uh, members. Uh, the other thing in terms of policies is. Uh, what kind of um, link to the regulator also, sorry, is what kind of a, a incentives will have to uh, have this kind of uh, infrastructure. For example, in the UK is one uh, case, um, there are subs or there were subsidies uh, to implement um, a charging points at home, but if they had a, a bidirectional communication capacity or capability, yeah? or the building codes, no? Building codes for new buildings, uh, already requesting ready, uh, uh, charging point ready uh, new buildings. So the infrastructure already uh, accommodate these new uh, loads. Um, and in terms also of the market, as uh, Matteo was mentioning, we have seen in the case of Denmark, a uh, test with a vehicle to grid where the business case was uh, hampered because for example, the issue of the taxation, these um, uh, charging points were taxed when they uh, charge the vehicle, and then when they discharge the vehicle, they will charge again. And uh, these are issues that can be easily addressed um, uh, in the market. Uh, the issue about the different types of services, ancillary services that can be provided by electric vehicles, because they don't have maybe the magnitude capacity, but they have the performance. So how fast they can provide certain services, for example, for frequency response, fast frequency response, it's, it's quite important. Yeah. But these kind of, of uh, markets are more uh, focused on the volume 
than on the performance of certain uh, services. So I think there is a still uh, a steep, uh, a le learning process there and how these markets could evolve. Right. Um, I'm going to follow that up directly with you, Francisco, with um, uh, a um, cut to the bottom line question from Charlie Smith. Um, uh, and uh, it sort of puts you on the spot a little bit, but it's a quick hitter. Um, he asks, um, have you in your work estimated um, the amount of investment, additional distribution system investment that's going to be required to decarbonize transportation? And I think uh, your work, uh, as, as with uh, Mateo's work, uh, mm -hmm. highlight that there could be a wide range depending on mm -hmm. how you approach it, but maybe so you could give kind of the low end and the high end, if you have it, uh, of the range of total additional investment that distribution system operators are going to need to make to decarbonize transport. Mm -hmm. And yeah, if you don't have very, it, don't, that's don't kind of, so. No, 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 it's okay. That's the kind of question I would expect from, from Charlie. <laughs> exactly. I mean, I, I wish we would know, and everyone would know, know how much this energy transition would require in terms of investment on infrastructure and, and so on. But let me tell, let me say a couple of things. The first thing that we have estimated, we have actually estimated in our energy transition outlook um, is how much would be needed in terms of investment on new renewable generation capacity and how much this energy transition will require in inf infrastructure, including grids, electric charging points, but also heat pumps, not, not only for the transport sector, but the whole uh, electricity system. And actually what is interesting is that the two uh, categories are at the same a level so basically we would be we would need to be investing around i think it's in the order of uh four uh, 400 a billion us dollars per year in up to 700 billion us dollars per year in new uh renewal generation capacity and a similar number in new uh, uh additional uh, infrastructure including everything of course grids electric charging points heat pumps etc so yeah, it's, it's quite significant. That's why when we discuss about a smart electrification approaches, the only way to go is a smart. <laughs> if we don't go with a smart approach, we will not make it. So it's not an option. We must go in a smart way. And now a smart way, how much they say, well, we have some indication. I mentioned the case of Hamburg, for example, we have the case of Beijing in California, they have, but let's say the ballpark number we have seen is that a smart, digitalized, with the right uh, regulation uh, framework, um, uh, against an uncontrolled uh, approach where you need a heavy investment in new cables, transformers, switches, and so on, is of one order of magnitude, so one to ten. Yeah. So again, the only way to go is really a smart. Thank you. Um, if the, none of the other panelists have a comment on that, I'll move to. Um, uh, a question I guess I'll put to Matteo, um, because to some extent it probably applies more to uh, heavy duty vehicle electrification uh, or perhaps medium duty vehicle electrification than to others. Um, how do you see, if you do, um, self driving vehicles impacting uh, charging behavior? No, that, that, that's a really good question. We see connectivity and automation really transforming the, the transportation se sector. And so we see that, that trend coming and we see that trend coming for light duty, for medium duty, for heavy duty vehicles. Uh, in terms of uh, impacts, uh, I, I think I'll have to say there is a lot of uncertainty, unfortunately. Uh, one, one of the things that, that though I, I, I want to mention is that an automated system is likely to be expensive uh, to deploy on a vehicle and then removes the driver constraints. And so those vehicles are likely to be driven as much as possible, right? So, so, so we could expect automation to sort of push those, those driving needs toward, toward the, the the upper ends of our of our vehicle distribution. That means we might need bigger batteries. That means we might need faster charging. That means we we we, we might you know we might see an impact from a, from a grid perspective. It might be it might be a 
a more significant load that needs to be accommodated. Uh, he, he also needs, he, he also means that there is an additional layer of flexibility where, where an automated vehicle can go and drive to a better location to charge, uh, for, for example. Uh, so, so it's hard in a sense to, to weigh the trade off. If I were to guess, I, I would, I would say that that automation is going to lead to, to higher energy needs and higher, higher charging power needs overall. Anybody else uh, have given any thought to that issue of, of the role of self-driving vehicles, if, if there is going to be any? Um, all right. Um, I want to get in at least one more, maybe two more questions. Um, and I'm going to put this one to Jay and Nigel, perhaps, um, again, uh, because you've sort of been at the rock face on these decisions or are at the rock face. Um, how do you... Think about balancing the really important, uh, the lock-in effect of the really important near-term decisions, infrastructure decisions in the distribution system um, versus what is likely to be for many years to come, a very fast changing technology, uh, service solutions and usage uh, environment. Well, I'll give that a shot. So we think about it all the time. I mean, it's it's a big part of what we do. We are, um, and particularly with transportation electrification, uh, we are looking for innovative ways to to serve this load. We're looking for innovative ways to serve our customers' needs, uh, and sometimes that means uh, offering direct to customer solutions on the residential side that would make them getting their ability to start down this road. Uh, a heck of a lot easier. We're experts at this. We can help them with that. So we spend a lot of time thinking about how to do things like that. And, you know, we've got programs and tariffs filed in, in several of our jurisdictions for residential customers. When it comes to, you know, something like, uh, you know, small commercial or fleets, that's a different story for now because, you know, we really need to look at each location individually and determine the best solution for each location and do not default to we're going to build a substation or we're going to build distribution circuits or upgrade a transmission line that may be required sometimes, but we really want to look at. Edge solutions that leverage technologies of the future really of today, uh, like solar and storage. Um, but we have to do that in a way because of the way our regulatory compact works. Uh, that still shows it's the best option for all customers, not just the one we're trying to serve. So that's kind of where this, the rules we got to follow today may not always line up with where we want to be uh, in the future to serve this type of load, but we're working on that, uh, working with our regulators uh, where appropriate to, to be able to offer more innovative services and solutions. Great, thanks. Nigel? Yeah, um, well, we have the same, same issues. Um, I mean, as I said, the regulator is very concerned about us, us investing ahead of need, um, demonstrated need. And, uh, you know, one of the solutions that was developed in, in Western Power Distribution was sort of a um, temporary active network management system to apply to local networks. But you can actually say to people, well, you've got a choice. It's either going to take us, you know, three, four months to upgrade the local system to allow you to have your vehicle charges at the rate you want. Or we can install this relatively simple control system and just constrain charging at certain times or share the charging out in terms of at lower rates for a period of time while the distribution upgrade takes place. So, yeah, that's the sort of solutions that are being looked at here if, if we can't do the strategic reinforcement. And clearly, you know, if we really do get the rate of growth of EV purchases that are projected to actually meet the government's targets, we are not going to be able to reinforce everywhere at once. It is going to take time. We are going to need solutions which do temporarily constrain people whilst some of those upgrades take place. We're just not going to have a choice on that. I'm going to try to squeeze in one more question, um, and it's actually a question I have, and it follows up on what you just said um, and what all of you have talked about. Um, we're, you know, I think. Look at looked at globally, we're still at a relatively low level of penetration of electrification and transport. And of course, we're trying to draw conclusions from that as to what the future is likely to look like in terms of charging behavior, usage behavior. 
Do you think we're far enough into that to know, or are we still really dealing with the behaviors of early adapters, early adopters? Um, and, and can we really say much for sure about what charging behavior and usage behavior is likely to be? I'll take a crack at that, uh, Mike, if that's okay. And and I think it's it is it is too early to say. Like we're talking about 10 million vehicles on the road globally. These are clearly early adopters. Even even in the United States, you know, we're talking about two two percent of of vehicle sales this year, a little bit higher. Um, I think the way that these vehicles are gonna are going to be charged in the future is going to be impacted by two big drivers. One, whether people can or cannot charge their vehicles at home. That makes a huge difference. And, and we know that today, the vast majority of, of EV charging happens at home. But we also know that as the market expands, not everyone will have access to a garage with a, with an outlet that w they, they can use to, to charge their vehicle at. So, so we know that that reliance on, on home charging is going to decrease over time. And it needs to be filled by something else. It could be workplace charging. It could be fast charging, like, like a gasoline station model, or it could be some sort of opportunity charging, like where you grocery shop or where you watch a movie or where you do something else. So, so, it, but, but, but this is still TBD in a sense. Another thing that I, I think we shouldn't forget is that consumers also adapt to technology. And so today we are all still in this mindset of like, you know, I drive my vehicle and every every now and then I need to stop by a gasoline station and refill it. And in a sense, that's our mentality. And it's gonna take many years to change that and fully embrace the fact that now I have electricity available at a number of different places. And, and that, that doesn't have to be the way that we charge vehicles. But but I think it's really gonna take time to, to change our, our attitude towards mobility. Um, unless someone else really wants to jump in on that, I, I think we've reached our 4.45 uh, time uh, and I appreciate very much everybody being um, uh, uh, disciplined and and providing extremely uh, uh, valuable insights. Um, so it's time to wrap up. Thank the panelists for their great contributions and their discussions today. And thank all of you for your participation. I think it says a lot about um, the quality of the discussion that until about a minute or two ago, we still had 84, 84 participants dialed into the call. Um, this has been a really fascinating discussion on the recent developments in electric transportation. As a reminder, we will follow up with written answers to the questions we didn't get to in the Q&A. There will be a couple of really interesting questions on the impacts on the bulk power system which I didn't pose because the focus of today's panel is on the distribution system, but they're really good questions. And hopefully our panelists will have a chance to respond to them in writing. All good things must come to an end and the fall workshop will be closing this week with the last session on Thursday. Closing plenary session deals with some timely topics and transmission and which will be chaired by Aaron Bloom of Nextera, uh, the chair of ESIG's system planning working group. I can promise you that it will be a very informative session and a fitting close to the fall workshop. There's no charge for the session, and a fit and uh, there's no charge for the session, and you are all invited to attend. Further information on registration is provided on the eSig website at www.esig.energy. Thank you again to our panelists and our participants. Please stay safe, and we look forward to seeing you all again on Thursday. Thank you to you too, Mike, as well, and to eSig for having us. Thank you.